Hi there, I'm Nafi Salatic and this is Across the Balkans, the show dedicated to the people, places and stories of southeastern Europe. On our very first episode, we look at the Dayton Agreement. Well, that was the deal signed 25 years ago that ended the war in Bosnia. But with peace came a complex, ethnic-based power-sharing arrangement, which people say is to blame for the country's inefficiencies. So has the Dayton Agreement really been a success? Semir Seifovic went to Bosnia and Herzegovina to find out. This is Mostar, a tourist magnet, usually flooded with people being entertained by locals jumping off the city's rebuilt old bridge. But due to COVID-19, shops are closed. There's an eeriness in the air and empty streets expose a darker side of Mostar. It's as if its intoxicating beauty came along with a curse. Mostar je nakon 25 godina od rata i dalje podijeljen. Vi ne vidite žive zidove, ali vidite zidove o koje udarate svakodnevno, a tome su doprinijele dvije nacionalističke stranke koje su na vlasti od kraja rata. Grad apsolutno ne funkcionira jer je stalno trvenje oko gradonačelnika i ostalih funkcija. Mislim da u stvari se ove dvije stranke jako dobro slažu u, u među sobom, međutim u javnom prostoru ne, neprestano se pune sa platformi mržnje s jedne, druge ili treće strane, puni se strahom ovaj prostor. Tako da ljudi kad glasaju i kad rade bilo što, oni uvijek iz nekog straha, jer je uvijek u javnom prostoru ta mržnja i nedavni rat i konflikt i ugroze neke imaginarne. Štefica Galić is no ordinary woman. She faced violence, received death threats and has been labeled a traitor. During the Bosnian war, she and her husband, both ethnic Croats, saved nearly 1,000 Bosniak civilians from a Croat militia. In the early 90s, Mostar was the front line of a brutal war. Back then, a Croat separatist force, known as the Croatian Defense Council, or HVO, seemed determined to ethnically cleanse the Herzegovina region of Bosniak Muslims and erase any trace of its Islamic identity. A young soldier in the Bosnian National Army, Nejad Kasumovic caught the destruction of the old bridge on camera. Da se može dogoditi jedan takav barbarski čin u režiji Hrvatskog vijeća odbrane i Hrvatske vojske. Ja sam nazvao stari most Insano i to nije kako su oni nazivali muslimanski most. To je most svih nas. The fighting here came to an end in 1994 and a year later peace terms were agreed to in the U.S. city of Dayton, Ohio in a deal known as the Dayton Agreement. Eventually, those responsible for war crimes were held accountable by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. Among the convicted were six senior Croatian officials. The HVO was charged for participating in a joint criminal enterprise in Mostar, meaning each member was individually responsible for crimes committed by the group. da niste mogli čuti da je osobno jedna od navedenih osoba tamo, od njih šest, bilo što osobno učinilo. Tako da s te strane udruženi zločinački povod u Hati je nešto što je apsolutno neprihvatljivo, zbog tog sam iskazao u tešku riječ da mi cijenimo da je ovo primarno kao poruka zločin prema svim častnim predstavnicima Hrvatskog vječa obrane pa i Hrvatskog naroda u Bosni i Hrvatskoj. Dok presude u Hagu mi smo mogli pozivati komšije na Katarzu, da moraju da se izvine, da moramo imati neko pomirenje. Nakon Haškog suda i presude Međunarodnog suda pravde, to je njihova obaveza, ne više naša. 
Mitsa Fetorucevic, the last mayor of Mostar. He resigned in 2001, not wanting to take part in politics that he felt further divided the city. In 2010, Bosnia's constitutional court ruled Mostar's previous elections unfair. It gave the government six months to discard its ethnic-based requirements. But more than 10 years later, both Bosniak and Croat ruling parties still disagree on how to do so. Safet tells me the onus is now on the Bosnian Croat leadership. The Dayton Peace Agreement was able to provide lasting peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it failed to reintegrate society. The agreement included the country's constitution. That document further divided Bosnia along ethnic lines between Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs causing years of nationalist politics. Now citizens are feeling they are both hostage to the agreement as well as nationalism. Wanting an end to the hostage situation created by the two ethnic nationalist parties, schoolteacher Irma Baralia sued Bosnia in the European Court of Human Rights. The verdict, a surprise. The two ruling nationalist Croat and Muslim parties were forced to hold local elections and agree to the terms. Da sam razbila te predresude i mitove koje ima oni nas filuju već 25 godina. Da pojedinac ne može da učini ništa, da samo možete učiniti nešto ako ste pripadnik neke nacionalne skupine ili neke velike nacionalne stranke. Meni je zaista drago da čak i jedan pojedinac može da učini mnogo i može da poljulja čitav jedan sistem. In December last year, after more than a decade, Mostar held its first elections, but Irma's hopes for change fell short. A majority of citizens, both Croat and Bosniak, again voted for the same nationalist parties, which deprived them of their rights to vote for so long. And neither party won enough votes to govern Mostar, leaving the city yet again without a government, and just as divided as ever. Semir Sejfovic, TRT World, Mostar. My guest today is the former Bosniak member of the presidency and the former prime minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Haris Ilajic. He joins me now from Sarajevo. Thank you so much for joining us here on uh, Across the Balkans. Now, you were there negotiating the Dayton Agreement on behalf of Bosnian delegation. Um, and more than 25 years later, even today, the representatives of three ethnic groups still have very different positions on how Bosnia's future should look like. Uh, what do you think needs to happen to make this country function like any other country uh, in Europe? Uh, good evening to you. Good evening to your viewers. What we need to do in Bosnia Herzegovina is for this ethnic groups become citizens again. The ethnic groups were imposed, the ethnic principle was imposed by genocide in Bosnia. We should go back to normal. But unfortunately there is more injustice, so you, can, you cannot heal the country with more injustice. We need some justice, we need some normalcy here. We need to go back to citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina not the ethnic groups. We were never ethnic groups here. This is the old plural country. Right, and what yeah. would your advice be to the Bosnian leaders that are in power at the moment, especially to those representing Bosniaks? Well, uh, to use now the initiatives that are prob probably coming from the United States of America, from Europe, to really create citizens Bosnia. This experiment imposed on us by genocide again has failed miserably. We have a beautiful country, a rich country, but we need some justice here, some normalcy, 
and the attention of the international community. And what about the region? Can Bosnia look uh, for partners among its neighbors? Is a solution possibly in some way in improving relations with Zagreb and Belgrade who could convince the ethnic groups in Bosnia to stop blocking reforms that could help the country finally move forward, as you say? Well, of course, we need good relations with our neighbors. Unfortunately, it's our neighbors, especially Serbia, that has done this to us. Their, their very bad policies. So they need to stop meddling into the business of Bosnia and Herzegovina and be a good neighbor. That's all. That's all we need from them. But they continue the policies of the 90s, unfortunately, until this day. So this must stop. And this will stop one day. And Bosnia and Herzegovina can be back to normal especially now with the good vib vibrations com coming from the United States and uh, President Biden, the right man in the right time, at the right time, in the right place. We need to go back to diplomacy, to multilateralism, and we already feel uh, good, these good vibrations. We hope it arrives here to, to us to Bosnia Herzegovina. As I said, this was never a divided country. This was done to us by the aggression and genocide. This is a very old European country, multi-confessional always, very tolerant. We have not attacked our neighbors, they attacked us, especially Serbia. So they need, they did not to ask for our territory they need not to expand their territory. They need to expand their horizons and grow. And then we can meet. And let me just ask you briefly, so who would you say are Bosnia's main partners? You seem very optimistic with Biden's administration uh, and uh, their uh, efforts for the future. But uh, does the EU also need to have more active role uh, in Bosnia now? Yes, of course, they are already active. And they are doing what they can for now. But I'm, I'm sure together with the United States, they, we all can do much better. And we need real solutions. We have had some attempts in the past. Not very good, not very professional. I must tell you, not with, with very good intentions. Uh, that's about enough in Bosnia. We've had enough of, of injustice. We need a just, good project for Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the majority of the uh, citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina are ready. We need a membership in NATO. That's our priority number one. When we are in NATO, then our neighbors will cease to do this, lose hope, and come back to normal. Okay, thank you so much for your time for us here on Across the Balkans. Uh, Haris Ilajic there, the former Prime thank Minister you. of Bosnia and Herzegovina and former Bosniak member of the Presidency. Thank you so much for being our first guest on Across the Balkans once again. Until the 1990s, much of the Balkans was united as one country, Yugoslavia. For several decades, it was ruled by communist leader Josip Broz, better known as Tito. Well, we sent Andrew Hopkins to Belgrade to see how Tito's legacy lives on. Apartment blocks that reach to the sky, towers with revolving restaurants, and an artificial beach hundreds of kilometers from the sea. I'm in Belgrade, the capital of the former Yugoslav Republic of Serbia, a city with a huge amount of communist-era architecture, which some people believe is a monstrous eyesore. But we're going to meet some people who are turning that to their own advantage. And what better way to show you than in an early model of Yugoslavia's most iconic car, the Yugo. The Yugo was seen as a symbol of national pride, even if it did become the butt of international jokes about its unreliability. This travel company is using them to run tours for curious tourists. Who goes on a tour like this? Actually, people love uh, us bringing them the idea of the, 
uh, communist country that doesn't exist anymore and the unity we had between our people in those years. After the Second World War, the country was in the hands of the communist Josip Broz, Tito. Within a few years, he had fallen out with Stalin and started building what he hoped would be a new modern city with a bold design. Blakovi became known for wide roads, green spaces, schools and health centres were in easy reach and it became home to people from all walks of life. Zoran Nikolic and Mirko Radonjic are authors of the book The Secrets of New Belgrade. I have two daughters. We live in a, in a, in a building in, in the 28th block in, in New Belgrade. Well, in the same building there is a kindergarten. Uh, in the adjacent building there's a swimming pool where they all, there, where they, both of them uh, learned how to swim. Uh, some 200 meters uh, away is the elementary school. They don't have to cross the street to get there. Of course Belgrade is more than just grey blocks, straight lines and brutalist architecture. There are many more influences in this city, so let's go and have a look. Buildings like the National Assembly and the New Palace, the base for the Serbian president, show how parts of the capital do predate the Second World War. But even here you can see the signs. More traditional European-style architecture intermingled with communist-era houses, which replace buildings damaged in the war. Duh Beograda je nalik na jazz u muzici. Dakle, uvek postoji neka improvizacija koja vas uvede ka nekom rešenju. Takva je njegova arhitektura, takav je i način života. Beograđani su verovatno najsentimentalniji, najnostalgičniji kada odu negde. For some residents, the feeling of longing may not extend to the Genex Tower. It's one of Belgrade's most famous buildings and often the subject of derision. And it was built with a revolving restaurant on top. A place used by Tito, former Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic, but not the general public. Stuffed in the cupboards, old menus can still be found. The original idea that because of the circular form of the restaurant, it was supposed to rotate. In 1977, when the idea came up to life, actually the only three restaurants in the world could do such a thing. And the only reason they gave up on that idea is because this is a brutally style building the, and the concrete is too heavy for any mach, uh, machine to rotate. In 1980, Tito died and a decade later, Yugoslavia started to break up. And a few years after that, NATO bombed Belgrade over Serbia's involvement in the Kosovo War. And it left many longing for more harmonious times in Yugoslavia. This restaurant is one of several in Belgrade that caters for what are known as Yugo nostalgists. It's packed full of Tito memorabilia. And you can even try on one of Tito's old military overcoats. The restaurant is decorated in the motives of the time of Tito, because the owner of the owner of the cafe was a patriot, a father, and he wanted to bring the motives of the time of Tito to young people to a time when the people who lived in the old people lived in the old people. The but their future could be more than just sentimentality and historic curiosity for tourists. This video is from an annual music festival called Nine, held in an old brickworks that now houses a major art centre. The factory used to employ more than a thousand people, Inside, it's now an exhibition space called Siglana. The man behind it is the sculptor Victor Kish. Ambicije za ovo mesto su mi da postane prepoznatljivo sa strane, da znači podržano sa strane države, da to praktično bude jedan prvi iskorak države da se iskoristi nešto od tih starih industrijskih industrijskog nasleđa da bi se praktično izašlo i u susret umetnosti, umetnika I, I mislim da bi to uticalo dosta i na turizam i na ekonomski, ekonomski detalj i brand i, uh, i sliku Srbije. And that's maybe the future for Belgrade, to find ways of regenerating some of these buildings so that they don't just remain for some a trip down memory lane. 
Thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans. See you next time.